Our guest in this segment is Dale Lee. He is the president of the West Virginia Education Association, the WVEA, on this first day of school, 2023. Good morning, Dale. Great to have you with us. Great to be with you. And, and I'll tell you what, Rob, I promise you, if I ever write a book, I'll dedicate it to you. <laughs> Thank you. And I appreciate <laughs> you. Pander. You know, <laughs> you know that's, <laughs> now let him pander. What's wrong with pandering? <laughs> pandering is good. I'll put it in large print. <laughs> no, see that? And I noticed you didn't say Bill as part no, of that, that, so I appreciate that, Dale. <laughs> I'm disappointed, Dale. I'm disappointed. I was well, hoping well, I'd be uh, attacked. Don't uh, make me turn your mic off, Bill. <laughs> you can't be You can't be harassing the guests. <laughs> this is one of the few times you've left it on, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. That was good. That was, that's a pretty good Monday morning wit there. Uh, Dale, first day of school 2023, what is the outlook across the state in terms of teacher positions filled uh, versus vacant? Uh, there's going to be more vacancies this year than there were last year. And we have been telling them since 2018 when there were 728 uh, during the little <clears throat> activity that went on in 2018 that we have to do something to address this issue. You, you, uh, grew to over 1,500 last year. It was, I think, 1,544. And I'm projecting it will be over 1,700 this year, uh, positions without a certified teacher in them. And just as important as that, there are a huge number of bus driver positions that are not going to be filled. Uh, you won't have people in those. You'll see uh, aides. You'll be able to possibly fill the first grade aides, but the people will be coming from special ed and other places, so those those will be uh, hard to fill. It's going to be a rough year. Dale, how do those positions get filled? Are they effectively calling up retired teachers and asking them to become uh, full-time regular substitutes again? Yeah, they, they have a provision now that you can have uh, uh, call a – position uh, a special needs position a, a specific need position where teachers retired teachers can work more than 133 or 140 days i think they were allotted uh, they can work full time you'll have that uh, you'll have people with out of field authorization like you may be certified in um, elementary and you can uh get a permit to teach in special ed or something like that. So so it won't be, these classes won't be vacant. You know, you won't have kids in there without somebody there, but it just won't be a fully certified teacher. In, in and the our producer on the show, Dylan Bishop, spent a good part of last year as a substitute teacher, uh, by the way, mm -hmm. too. Uh, Bill Stubblefield, good morning to you. Yeah, good morning, Dale. Uh, there's shortage of teachers throughout the country, so West Virginia is sure. not unique here. Uh, what could we have done in the state to uh, 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 to at least reduce the problem that we're seeing right now? Or is there anything that we could have done? Well, we dropped to 50th in the nation in pay, uh, and, and that's even after – raises over four of the last five years we've dropped to 50 so we're not keeping up with the the uh, surrounding states particularly and that's what i look at i look look at our contiguous states and see how much more that you can make driving 30 minutes across the line particularly hard hit are you all in the eastern panhandle where you have some of the highest paid areas in maryland pennsylvania uh, loudon county virginia uh, teachers are just leaving. I mean, they're just going across the line to teach. And secondly, more less, fewer people are going into education to begin with. It, it's, uh, you'll see if you look at the higher ed report, numbers are down, and a lot of our, our colleges and universities are actually cutting some education programs. The numbers are so low, so. You have to make it attractive for people to come into the profession, and then uh, we have to want to keep them in, in West Virginia. And one of the ways to do that is is to make our pay competitive, and more importantly, to show the respect to our educators. Uh, Dale, and 
uh, and I agree with you 100%. Uh, uh, but well, this you just got in that book, too. Dude. I just got in that book. Exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's not be so easily swayed here, Dale. Hold, <laughs> hold strong, yeah. buddy. Yeah. But this, this I kind very, of. I very rarely get agreed with. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm only. Uh, that was kind of my lead, and I'm not about to agree with you on the second part. Uh, okay. And the second part is being locality pay. You have never, if I memory serves, you're not a big supporter of locality pay, but yet you just mentioned the uh, the eastern panel handle is is unique in uh, the competition that we have well first of all i've never said that i'm against locality pay but i'm a realist and and you have to be able to pass locality pay and you've seen in this legislature over the years that a locality pay in any category whether it be for educators or i think jason barrett tried when he was in the house to pass it for uh, state police it won't pass because you have five counties that will want to pass it and 50 counties delegates that that don't that won't that say our people deserve the same as that what i've continually advocated is reducing the local share and that's letting the eastern panhandle and all the counties actually keep more of their tax dollars and use those tax dollars for salaries and benefits. Uh, we reduced it several years ago. We went from 98% to 90% where the state kept 90% of it. And the Eastern Panhandle used it, Berkeley and Jefferson in particular used it for salaries or housing allowances and things like that. And, and that helped. If you reduce it down to 80%, that gives you a, a larger part of, pot of money to, to be able to fill those things. But I would add the caveat that that had to be used for uh, salaries or benefits because some counties use it to uh, repair roofs and things like that. Well, that's that's not going to keep your teachers in the county. So, so I, I why, why I'm I'm I, I'm haven't I've never said I'm against locality pay. I'm a realist, and the way to achieve locality pace so to speak is uh through the local shares because every county benefits that way has the wbea ever taken a position uh on locality pay well what our position is is to reduce local share to okay yeah, every county okay more yeah, than yeah, okay fair enough john gilstrap good morning <clears throat> it seems to me that whenever we talk about money in terms of pay in particular that's just too easy uh an answer. I mean, if nobody gets into public education with the idea of getting wealthy, obviously. Now, right. having a disparity across the border, um, that, that is certainly an issue and it's something that needs to be addressed. But do you think if, if, if in your discussion with teachers and such, when you do surveys or, or whatever, if there were, pick a number, a, a $10,000 increase in pay, does that really result in in filling all of these empty slots or do the other conditions that we hear about play perhaps a larger role and that is the disciplinary issues in the classroom and the administrative burden that's being put on teachers and that sort of thing sort of quality of classroom life i i, I think you're correct that ten thousand dollars probably won't do it it would take uh addressing all of this as a whole and a big part of that as i said earlier is you have to put the respect back and, and putting your respect back allows the educator to be the expert in public education not uh the lawmakers making the laws not the people telling us how bad we are all the time based on a a test score like a, a nap test score which is a single snapshot in time and it's a random selection of 14 percent of the fourth graders and 13 percent of the eighth graders across the state uh, you know, so it's not a, a good indication. But with that, a large part of it is going choosing to go into education when you know you're not going to get paid like you could in any other profession. Fewer and fewer students are going into education, so it's it is a combination of everything. So if you were. You, you talk about bringing respect back into the classroom. Now, obviously, there's a lot of issues that go into that as well. So short of a massive re-education program for parents, how, how do you solve, what are some steps that go into solving 
that problem? One of the things that we need to do is is to really focus on the emotional and, and uh, behavior issues that our students have and, and the emotional and, and mental uh, security of our, of our educators. You know, you're, you're being placed in situations like never before. Uh, you know, there's no subs. There are vacancies, everything else. So pe- teachers are giving up their planning periods. They're doubling up classes. They're really getting burned out. So you have to look at that, uh, the, the mental state of our, our educators. And secondly, the discipline is a huge issue. You know, it's, it's gone down to as far as, as uh, kindergarten and first, second grade. Uh, I've advocated that we look again at, at a program that we had early in the, in the 2000s with innovation zones when you put an uh, alternative setting in elementary schools so that uh, when a student is disrupted, disrupting the class, you can remove them from the class. They can go work on their, their behavior and their academics. And when we did that, we saw an increase in achievement and a decrease in behavioral issues. We had to stop doing that because they stopped funding the innovation zones. But, uh, you know, we, we can't – you can't teach kids to be on level at reading and math and, and everything else if, if you're not addressing these behavior issues. Dale – Probably everybody listening to this show right now remembers being younger in school, and there was always the kid or kids here or there who were a distraction, but they were dealt with. Mm -hmm. How did that get away from us, being able to deal with these problem children in a way that now it seems we can't? What happened? And, and And take innovation zones out of the equation for a moment because they didn't exist when I was a kid. Yet, if there was a kid who was being a distraction in a classroom, they were quickly removed, and soon enough, they weren't a distraction any longer. They certainly weren't a distraction the entire school year. What went wrong? Well, a uh, part of it is, again, back years ago, the educator was very respected, and, and the educator was right. And uh, you're, ta- you you're talking about in the, in the eyes of the parents you're talking about. In the eyes of the parent. When you got in trouble in school, you got in trouble at home. Uh, that's the way it was in, in our house. When I have three brothers, and can you imagine four boys? We, somebody was always uh, in, in a bad situation, mm-hmm. so to speak. But when you got in trouble in school, you were in trouble when you got home. Uh, the family unit was, was stronger then. Uh, we've had a, a breakdown of the family unit. When more and more of our kids are being raised by grandparents or uh, a single parent or a relative or, or things like that, you know, the, the family unit has, has broken down. Uh, it's a combination of a lot of issues like that, and and we just uh, have have to go back to to working on these behavior issues. We didn't have the opioid problem that when we were growing up that that there is today we didn't have uh parents uh kids seeing their parents arrested overnight or overdosing or dying and things like that there there's so many more issues now that the kids deal with than than what we had to when back in the day when we walked to school six miles uphill in the snow knee deep so yeah dale to, to address some of these problems if memory serves you did a series of town hall meetings was mm-hmm. it last year or year before last what two was years the, ago. two years ago what was the result of that and how did you and who did you give your report to we gave a report to the legislature and uh, it was last year actually we mm-hmm. gave a report to the legislature and, and to the state board and all of the things that i talk about the respect the the pay the uh, discipline issue, the the uh, need to let teachers teach and, and trust in their expertise, all of those were in that report. Uh, no actions were taken by the legislature for, for these things, even though we brought it to both the House and Senate Education Committees and made recommendations, then, then nothing was done. How was it, uh, you said no action was taken. How was it received by the committees? Do you know? Uh, it was received well. I mean, it, it wasn't 
breaking news. It wasn't new information. It was the same thing that uh, was said four years earlier when the state board uh, did their listening tour. Uh, these problems haven't changed. We just haven't dealt with the solutions yet. Do you anticipate there will be some interest in addressing in addressing these solutions? I, I wouldn't still be doing this if I wasn't hopeful okay. that we can make changes to to further improve a, a good education system in West Virginia. John, it occurs to me this really isn't a new. It, it's a new problem, I think, in in our communities in like Berkeley County and and, and the, the more um, suburban, for lack of a better term, uh, counties. But this has been a uh, city school problem forever. I mean, we've got the Blackboard Jungle was filmed in what in the mid 1950s, where you you saw the breakdown of high school uh, discipline in the in the inner city schools, and in every case, it seems to me, certainly in the fictional world, and I presume it's based on fact, the solution is discipline, like discipline, discipline. So, is it possible within the structure? I don't want to be naive here. Within the structure of of the, the school system. Is an individual county, could Gilstrap County within West Virginia hire a school superintendent and empower the school superintendent to be the arbiter of all things and say, you know, within the bounds of the law, the superintendent tells his principals that you're the law in your school and he empowers the teachers to enforce discipline as we had it in, in school. Is, is that... Could that be done with strong leadership, or are there laws in the way to keep that from being done? Well, one of the things that, that I think we really need to look at is uh, the old adage of just suspending schools and, and uh, I mean, suspending students over and over. Uh, that's not really working on what's causing that behavior. That's not that's not addressing what's causing that behavior. Uh, when I when I was teaching. The one that never made sense to me, a kid would skip school, and so you'd suspend them for three days. Well, they didn't want to be there to begin with. <laughs> I never understood that one either. Yeah, you're just rewarding them for, for doing that. So that's that's why I think we need to start at the elementary schools and addressing these behavior issues and, and working on those behavior issues. What does that mean to address the behavior issues? Well... If, if a student is constantly disruptive, there's there's got to be a reason. It, it may be academics. It may be something at home. It may be, uh, uh, you know, em emotional problems or something like that. We have to figure that out and address that and and learn to, to provide coping mechanisms for that student rather than just say, well, they were disruptive, so we're going to send them home. But on the other hand, you know, and at the risk of getting triggering some hate mail here, I'm not sure. Is it really the school's responsibility to take care of that? It seems to me that the schools should be focused on giving the the, the most of the attention should go toward the kids who want to have an education and want to be there. And so much of the the mental real estate is taken up by the miscreants and the troublemakers that that actually takes away from the learning of the kids who want to be there. So for when, when somebody is suspended, yes, perhaps we're scratching exactly the itch that they want to have scratched, but it also benefits the kids who are left behind and can learn. Well, and that's, that's why it's going to take a combination of the community involvement, the parents' involvement, uh, and the school involvement all to, to really deal with these issues and, and come up with solutions. We can't do it all to school. Uh, and, and I think parents and guardians need some help also so so we have to work in unison to figure this out yeah, john getting the parents the community the schools all working together is a nice thing to say in practicality mm -hmm. though it's going to be except, exceptionally difficult it's my sense that the model of the schools are based upon what we knew 25 30 40 years or so ago but yet the family structure has changed during that period of time uh has there is there any movement at all into trying in having the school cons uh the uh, schools approach to change along with the family structure in other words taking a difficult different approach than what we've historically been doing I don't know what that it would be. I'm just I'm asking as a kind of a, um, a curious question. I, I think you're seeing changes uh, as we go along. There, there are uh, uh, we are differentiating instruction 
quite a bit more than than there were 40 years ago. There's uh, uh, programs now that uh, we're, we're looking at our middle schools and and, and doing some vocational and technical uh, classes in, in those. We're trying to reach kids. We what we have to do is stop teaching like every kid's going to be an engineer and teach them to go to college. We have to figure out how what their interests are and and move forward that way and 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 i think we're we're heading in that direction in west virginia it's just a slow process we don't have time for a slow process do we well we don't have time for a slow process but if we don't start and do something five years from now we're going to say why didn't we address that issue it's it's a it's a tough job and i think what we need especially this time of year is to give all of our teachers a uh heartfelt gratitude because it is a tough job it's one of the toughest job I, jobs i can imagine and they need all the support we can possibly give them all, all of our educators do and i'm i'm glad you said that it it is true that it is uh a tough job for not only our teachers, but our bus drivers, our aides, our cooks, and everything else. I mean, when I'm teaching, I have the kids facing me, and I'm looking at them. I imagine a bus driver with 60 kids and his back to them, having to watch the road, and, and those kids, too. So all of it is difficult situations. Dale, we're just about out of time in this segment. Any final thoughts on this upcoming school year? Well, I think uh, I, I urge parents and guardians to get involved with their kids to to work with the educators and find out what they can do to to best enhance the education process for their students and and to uh it, it's it's something that we all have to get together to do and i urge communities to get involved hey, a quick question on the way out here i know in berkeley county they have chosen to use the aids that the legislature has uh has funded for first grade uh, mm -hmm. has first grade been the most popular selection around the state dale if you well, know it's a, it's a phase in it's uh so this year the aides will be in the first grade uh next year they'll they'll uh introduce them again in the second grade and then third year uh there'll be aides in kindergarten first second and third grade so it's a it's a three year three-year phase in. Uh, I was under the understanding in this first year they could select anywhere from first to third grade to place the aides. Uh, are you saying that yeah, most of them then just chose first? first? They'll, okay. they'll be going in first grade. Very yeah. good. All right. Hey, thanks, Dale. Always good to talk with you. Good to talk to you guys, too. And and uh, don't don't hold your breath till I write that book. Because, uh, <laughs> thanks, Dale. Well, that's okay, thank you. It's disappointing, Dale. I'm sorry. <laughs> you could write a book just on all those old coach stories that you have and your problems with the referees. You know, I probably could, and, and uh, all three of us that would buy it would enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> have, a, have a good day, sir.